Good afternoon. I'm so excited to host today's Link and Learn, hosted by the KU Graduate Certificate in Workplace Professional Communication, titled Communicating for Inclusion, Strategies for Engaging People Across Boundaries of Place and Culture. So just a couple of reminders. Um, I know that many times when people first log on to the Link and Learn, my beautiful face is in large proportion. So you can hover over that and then find the icon to minimize it and it will shrink the size of the images. Um, and you can put those off to the side of your desktop uh, viewer. And then also towards the end of our session, we'll have just a quick two question survey just to learn more about your experience today. And then there's a chat and a Q&A function. So as we go throughout the webinar, I have someone here that will help me monitor as we go through if you have uh, need extra clarification or have particular questions. Um, and those are at the bottom. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you, those should pop up if you hover and you'll be able to see those functions. All right, so I'm Dr. Angela Gist, a faculty member here at KU, and I have dual appointments at the KU Edwards and Lawrence campuses. And I teach classes in our graduate certificate in professional workplace communication, as well as our undergraduate master's and doctoral programs in organizational communication specifically. My research looks at issues of social mobility and power, specifically relating to social identity and social class. And I'm also fascinated with issues of organizational culture. My dissertation research looked at job search communication, networking, power imbalances across social class lines. So we did an ethnographic study of blue collar and white collar workplace um, unemployment support groups. Before earning the doctorate in communication, I worked in advertising for approximately five years and I served clients in different industries, including furniture, automotive, telecommunication, technology, banking, and healthcare. So today's objectives are to understand the influence of changing demographics on our workforce, to define commonplace language and buzzwords that surround issues of diversity and inclusion, to start and develop cultural sensitivity in communication, and to learn strategies to recognize and address cultural insensitivity in our workplaces, as well as practical strategies to promote inclusiveness. Workforce demographics are changing literally the landscape of our workplaces and our professional lives. Higher percentages of women and minorities and different age cohorts are manifesting in our workplaces. And so it's important for professionals to be globally minded as well as culturally competent and inclusive in the way that we work and collaborate in our professional lives. So just as a starting point, I wanna share with you some sort of underlying assumptions about our conversation today. Number one, we each view the world, ourselves and others from a particular standpoint. So it's important to realize that our vantage point may not be the same as other people, um, but that the way that we view the world is unique and valuable. Everyone is an expert in their own lived experience. So the way that we experience our own lives, both professionally and personally, um, there's a truth in that, regardless of what that perspective is, that we all have been targets and perpetrators of bias and prejudice. And also that it's important to be mindful of our culture um, and difference. So the conversation that we're going to have today is really about respecting people and sharing human dignity. It's not about being politically correct. And many times when we talk about these issues, particularly in workplace standpoints, um, people think about it as a way to avoid getting in trouble or just to simply be politically correct. And that's just not the case. Um, I really want to promote this as a way to extend goodwill and trustworthiness to other people in our work lives. All right, so let's first start with some of these changing demographics. By 2013, projections state that Hispanics, Asian Americans, and African Americans, and other racial and ethnic minorities will comprise one third of the US population. So because of these sort of shifts, you've noticed that certain groups are becoming much more vocal about their expectations for fairness and equality, and that definitely includes the workplace. Value for differences is constantly increasing in society. You, st you will start to see this in various mission statements and value statements, as well as corporate social responsibility efforts. And research has shown that there are organizational benefits and outcomes to having a diverse workforce. Groups and companies that are more diverse actually show higher levels of creativity, productivity, problem solving skills, better quality products and services. They're more nimble and more adaptable to our changing global environment. And there's also less conflict in the workplace, which is really important to note. When we start to look here specifically in Johnson County, which is where I'm broadcasting to you from, um, we can see this shift happening uh, in our own local communities, right? So this graph shows from 2000 to 2014, the growth across age cohorts in ethnically 
and racially diverse groups. And so these changes are happening in our own backyard. These aren't something that are happening simply across the nation, but in our own communities. If we start to think about the way that these issues scaffold, right, we can start at the core, the interpersonal and individual level. When people feel valued for what they bring to the table, what they bring to their positions, um, then that enhances and empowers them in their interactions with other people. We can see how much we have to learn from other people who are unlike us. When we look at the team and group level, again, research shows, particularly Cox and Blake's cases, case for business diversity. Um, it shows that diverse teams can generate better ideas, better problem solving, and be more productive than homogenous groups, people of same demographic characteristics. We also have benefits at the organizational and company institutional level. Um, and so we start to see um, how organizations become more nimble and adaptive to changing environments. And then at the societal level, also these benefits to democracy, peace, and prosperity. Okay, somebody mentioned that the volume's fading, so I'll pull the microphone closer, is that better? Thank you for bringing that to our attention. But these topics are not popular to talk about, right? So anytime somebody brings up race or sexual orientation or age differences, it's like the elephant in the room. People do not want to acknowledge it, they don't want to address it. It becomes sort of an awkward conversation that can stilt collaboration. So my question to you is, and this is our first polling question for today, why do you think most people avoid talking about difference or diversity and the other isms at work, right? Is it because they, one, have no idea what to say, two, have a fear of inadvertently offending other people, three, have feelings of guilt or shame or anger or any other emotion, four, are tired of just hearing about it, right? Feel like we're beating a dead horse, like it's just constantly a topic of conversation. And then five, feeling that it's someone else's problem, right? So this isn't your issue, that maybe we should just move forward because that's someone else's problem. So we'll wait a few minutes for the polling question to launch. We've got 33 people logged on today. Um, so we've got about half of the responses pulled. Couple more responses. Okay, we'll end our polling. So overwhelmingly, the response is number two, that there is a fear of inadvertently offending someone. That's a commonplace feeling about these approaches. There are many, many obstacles to valuing difference. And I intentionally use the word difference over diversity because I feel as if diversity is such a buzzword that it has all these negative connotations surrounding it. One is that it can arouse a lot of negative feelings, feelings of discomfort, shame, guilt, frustration, conflict, and embarrassment. Also, outsiders within may feel singled out. Outsiders within is a, a phrase that's used in the scholarship that talks about difference in diversity at work. Um, in particular, it talks about majority members who consider themselves to be outsiders who have made it into dominant majority spaces. But many times, those folks are tokened, asked to speak on behalf of their entire social demographic group um, about a particular issue. Dominant group members, folks in the majority, may feel threatened or guilty. There are perceptions of hypersensitivity or hyperinsensitivity. Right? So if I speak out about a racial issue at work, people may see me as being hypersensitive, I can't take a joke, um, and vice versa. If someone shuts me down, then I may perceive them as being hyperinsensitive, and so this becomes an obstacle. Also, communication withdrawal, because we don't know what to say, or we're tired of talking about it, we simply just avoid the topic. And then finally, there's a fear or stigma of offending other people. Um, which is commonly, we don't in general want to be seen as bad people, right? We think highly of ourselves and we'd like to think that we're good folks. And so that's really sort of critical in terms of thinking about engaging in these difficult dialogue or as some people call them conscious conversations. 
ultimately there's just a lot of fear involved. Um, but I'll encourage you to sort of grapple with that fear. Unless we sort of explicitly address these issues, there's no way to move forward in society. And as you've noticed, I'm sure in the news, these things are becoming increasingly heightened. So let's first start by defining some buzz terms, some key concepts. Um, these are working definitions. I don't think of these as absolutes, but I'll, you'll hear many of these words throughout today's session. And I just want you to have sort of a common understanding of how I'm thinking about them. So number one is social identity. Think of your social identity as your memberships in various social groups. This could be your gender, race, your ability, your age, your social class. It could even be an organizational affiliation, right? So I have a social identity with KU as an employee there. Also culture, which refers to the patterned ways that people behave, communicate, and give meaning to shared life. So when we talk about communicating across culture, they're really deeply tied to our belief and value systems. Bias could be either implicit or explicit, but this is an inclination either for or against something or someone because of a social category. And again, these can be positive, right? If you have a positive bias or a negative bias, um, this past weekend, I went to um, my future stepdaughter's basketball tournament and noticed how many parents have a positive bias towards their athlete, their student athlete who's playing. They just cannot imagine that that athlete would make a foul, for example. Also, prejudice. Prejudice is an attitude towards an individual based on one or more social identity characteristics. Discrimination are actions that we make based on those prejudice and bias. And so we can make a distinction either positively or negatively against a group or class or category to which a person belongs rather than their individual merit. Marginalization are people who are socially constructed as useless in society and have sort of been pushed to the margins of life. They've been pushed out of our communities um, and made and deemed devalued. Diversity, and again, I like to use the word difference, is the state of being diverse, a variety, a range of different things, a state of people who have different cultures or an orientation. Inclusion is the act of including, the state of being included or the act or practice of making people feel welcome, regardless of their cultural background. And then finally, privilege, which is unearned, unasked for, and often invisible benefits and advantages experienced in society. And these are typically by dominant group members. Many times when I talk about privilege, I remind folks that it has nothing to do with merit. Privilege is not something that we earn or can work for. It's not about how hard we work. It's not about how, um, it is only about how the systems and structures are built to advantage certain people over others. In my classroom, I simply talk about handedness. So being right-handed or left-handed or ambidextrous. In the U.S., we live in a society that is clearly biased and privileges right-handers. It's much easier to find a computer mouse or a notebook or a desk in a classroom that is suited for a right-handed individual. And so that becomes a privilege because as a person who's right-handed, I don't have to think about those items in my life. If you're left-handed, you have to go out of your way and pay extra money for a left-handed notebook. You have to go out of your way to find the one or two left-handed desks in a large lecture classroom. And so these are disadvantages. Again, they're things that we inherit in our society. But if you think about the way that privilege and disadvantage operates on the basis of race or sexual orientation or age, you can start to see how there are advantages and disadvantages placed on different social groups. And again, they're not things that we earn or ask for. They're simply built into the structure of society. Intersectionality is also a huge popular buzzword, especially when talking about identity in the workplace. So this is the way that multiple different social identities that we have interact with one another, right? So if you think about a person's race, social class, religion, gender, sexual orientation, age, all of those things intersect and contribute to a particular experience in life. So I am a black woman in my mid thirties who's heterosexual and middle class. I've also earned a doctorate and all of those things mean something about me and intersect with one another. The way that I walk through life, the way that I experience my work is very different than someone who may be Asian American transgender man who is in his mid sixties and lives in Los Angeles, for example, or someone who is a lesbian white woman in her early twenties that lives in rural Kansas and has a learning disability. Those things change the way we experience life and that unique intersection sort of defines and colors our worldview. 
If you fall into certain identity categories, your voice may be listened to or silenced. It can strongly influence your likelihood of, for example, becoming gainfully employed or being underemployed. It can influence your, for example, receiving approval on a mortgage loan. Um, maybe the frequency with which you're pulled over for a traffic stop, or maybe the way that your kids are treated in school. The list goes on and on. But the intersection of our identities constrain the choices that we make in life. Many times we put a lot of weight on individual choice and how those choices manifest in our life outcomes. But so do the biases and prejudices of other peoples. And those biases and prejudices and discrimination impact the choices that we're able to make and the way that we're able to navigate our lives. One way that these things rear their ugly, play, their ugly head in the workplace is through a concept called microaggressions. Microaggressions are defined as brief and commonplace daily verbal and behavioral or environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, which communicate hostile derogatory or negative slights, invalidation, and insults to an individual or group because of their marginalized status in society. Basically what this definition is saying is that people from marginalized groups experience microaggressions on an ongoing basis throughout their lives, um, and they serve to hurt, invalidate, and insult people. They typically happen to women, minorities, non-native English speakers, and people with disabilities, um, alternative sexual orientations, or other identity groups, although they can happen to anybody for any identity. This is established in the two books that I have in front of you by Daryl Dwing Su, uh, Microaggressions in Everyday Life, Race, Gender, and Sexual Orientation, and Microaggressions and Marginality, Manifestation Dynamics, and Impact. So just to give you an example of one way this might come out in the workplace, um, I'm going to play a short clip to you, and I want you to think about how microaggressions are manifesting in this workplace scenario. Hi, you mind if I eat here with you? Of course. Okay. So we are being the new kid. <laughs> I'm Madison. Oh, I'm uh, Casey. Hi, I'm Ken. So where are you from, Ken? Um, from San Francisco. I was at that branch for a little bit and just transferred now. Where are you from, from though? Um, yeah. That's giving me where my family's from. Uh, China, I guess. Cool, you're Chinese. American. Oh, right, Chinese American. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, I'm from the Midwest, and um, we're not the most culturally diverse part of the country, you know. Oh, I forgot my coffee at my desk. I'll be right back. You know this one? What? Where are you from? From? Ooh, you're Chinese. Is so ignorant. I mean, she honestly might not know much about your culture. It's true what she said, that the Midwest isn't very diverse. I mean, trust me, I'm from Kentucky. Oh, well, no way. That's cool. I don't think I've ever met anyone from Kentucky before. What are you guys called? Like, Kentuckers, Kentuckets? I think the proper term is Kentucky. Huh. You lived there your whole life? Born and raised. That's crazy. You have no accent. Uh, I just didn't pick one up. How damn grits, son? What was that? Kentucky's part of the South, right? That's that's my Southern accent. Well, not all of us speak like that. You oh understand? Oh my gosh! Okay, look what I'm having for lunch: Kentucky Fried Chicken. What a coincidence! Uh, huh? I bet you love this stuff. Oh, here, have some. Uh, uh, I actually don't eat it that often. You know what? I just remembered. My roommate in college was actually from Kentucky. His name is Corey. Do you know Corey? You want to know if I know Corey because we're both from Kentucky? Uh huh. No, I don't know Corey. Have you ever been to the Kentucky Derby? I've never been to the Kentucky Derby, but it's in Kentucky. Yes. So why don't you go? That's true. So, I was thinking, Ken, you must have been born here because you don't have any accent at all. Okay, Madison. Just because I'm Chinese doesn't mean I have a Chinese accent by default, okay? It doesn't mean that I eat orange chicken and fortune cookies all the time. It doesn't mean that I know all your Asian friends. It doesn't mean I hang out in Chinatown every night. Why don't you go educate yourself, okay? Don't be so ignorant. Jeez. Oh my. Yeah. I didn't mean for my questions to be offensive. But I was just genuinely curious. I just think that we can all be more culturally aware in the situation. Just be more sensitive towards others. Right. right. You know, I. 
actually do really miss this stuff. Do you want some fried? I'm gonna throw what? Hey everyone, hope you like that sketch. It was actually based on a true story. I uh, met a guy named Casey on set once and he was from Kentucky and I was asking him all these questions about where he was from and then I caught myself in the middle of it thinking, man, if someone was asking me these questions about being Chinese, I would probably be pretty offended. Uh, but he took it cool, uh, so thanks and sorry, Casey. I was just generally, you know, just really interested about Kentucky. So in this scenario, um, I want to ask you a certain polling question. So who committed a microaggression, right? And again, I have the definition of microaggression here for you. It means a common daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignity, whether intentional or unintentional, which communicates hostile, derogatory, or negative slights, invalidation, and insults to an individual or group because of their marginalized status. So we'll launch the polling question. Polling question is who committed a microaggression in this workplace scenario? Madison, Casey, Ken, all of the above or none of the above? While you're responding to that, we have a viewer question. And the question is, why is the word privilege used over the word advantage? What is the difference between microaggression and unconscious bias or prejudice? These are great questions. So the word privilege is used because that's been established in the scholarly literature by Peggy McIntosh. Um, and so if you think about it, these advantages are privileges that we experience. Um, and I can give you one example. For example, when I'm walking out, let's say I'm in the grocery store, um, if I pay with a credit card that has my title of doctor on it and someone sees that, the way that they respond to me immediately changes. They're kinder to me, they're nicer to me, they're more patient with me than if they don't realize that I have a doctorate. So my education affords me certain privileges in life by being treated better. That gives you an example. Um, what is the difference between microaggression and unconscious bias or prejudice? So unconscious bias is again an inclination towards or against something or someone. And prejudice is an attitude that is based on a bias. A microaggression is an actual type of communication. And so while these things are definitely all related, they are distinct concepts. Hopefully that answers your question. So we have the polling results. Yes, all of the above. Every single person um, in that scenario committed a microaggression. And that's one of the things that I think is so important about this topic, right? So it's not just um, people who are in positions of power that can commit microaggressions. Anybody can be sort of a victim of them, a target of them, or a perpetrator. So today we're going to talk about four different types of microaggressions to dive in a little deeper. Um, number one is micro insults, two micro invalidations, three micro assaults, and the fourth is hierarchical microaggressions. So I'll define these for you and then tell you stories and examples from my own personal experience. So the first is micro insult. These are communication that subtly or implicitly conveys stereotypes, rudeness, and insensitivity that demeans a person's heritage or identity. Um, so I think it was the first year I moved to the Metro Kansas City area. I had met a new professor in the English department, and she and I had decided to try to become friends and hang out on a Saturday. So that Saturday morning, we went to brunch, we went to the spa, and then we were in Brookside, if you're familiar with the area, doing a little shopping. And we walked into a jewelry store, a little boutique jewelry shop. And if you know anything about me personally, you know that I love the color purple. So they had an entire jewelry case of like semi-precious purple stones and I made a beeline to the counter. And when we walked in, there were two employees that were behind the counter and they never greeted us. So that could be considered, considered a microaggression. Right, that's an environmental sort of indignity. Again, this is a small boutique, so it's not as if they didn't see us. The, I was standing probably five feet away from the person behind the counter. So after about a few minutes of looking in the counter, I decided that I wanted to try one of the rings on. And so I said, excuse me, can I get some help? I'd like to try on a ring. And a gentleman came from behind the counter and he said, sure. And he opened up the counter and I tried it on. And as he was pulling it out, I sort of peeped the price tag because I wanted to see if I could splurge on it and take it home with me today. And I could. And so I tried it on and I said, you know, if this fits, it's coming home. So I tried it on. It felt like a glove. And I told him, I'll take it. And he paused and showed me the price tag and said, are you sure? And I said, yes, I am sure. And so he said, then, what do you do for a living? So at this point, I realized that he has made some assumptions about who I am and what I can afford in the store. And so I tell him I'm a college professor, and his response was, no, no, there's no way. Mm -mm. Nope. College professors are old men with beards. 
And so at that moment, I realized that he had been definitely been making some assumptions about my capabilities, my competence, my intelligence, and also had the stereotype about who qualifies to be a college professor. So as we walk toward the counter then, he says, you mean you're an adjunct, you teach at like the community college? And I said, no. And he said, well, in order to be a professor, you have to have a doctorate. And I said, yes. And I said, my friend here, she is a professor too. And she was also an African-American woman. And he said, what? No. And I said, yes. And then I said, you know what today, sir, our purpose is, our purpose is to give you a new idea about what a professor could look like. And I bought my ring and I left. And there are many different ways in which I could have responded to that micro insult, right? I could have stormed out and spent my money elsewhere. I could have gone off um, about the sort of assumptions that he had made about me. But I chose in that moment to sort of try to make a positive impact in a teaching moment. Um, that isn't always the case, but in that moment, that was what I decided to do. The second type of microaggression is called a micro-invalidation. And these are verbal and nonverbal communication that subtly excludes, negates, or nullifies the thoughts, feelings, or experiential reality of a marginalized person. And so I have the example here on the, on the image of the slide, no, really, where are you from? Um, and it basically invalidates someone's sense of belonging, right? It says that you don't belong here, and so now I'm going to question that identity. Um, many years ago, this was in 2010, I was the maid of honor in my best friend's wedding, and the whole bridal party was at a nail salon, and we were getting our nails done. And my nail technician asked me, where was I from? And I said, oh, we've all come in from the wedding, and I just traveled here from St. Louis, Missouri. And she said, no, where are you from from? Are you Indian? Are you Middle Eastern? And I said, oh, black. And she said, no, 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 I would never call you black. To which I paused, and I said, no, I am black. And she says, really? But you're so pretty. And so in that instance, we can see the micro-invalidation is really unconscious, right? She's trying to give me a compliment, but it's what's not said in that compliment that's actually so offensive. It's a backhanded compliment that makes the assumption that people from my race are not pretty or beautiful. The third type is called a micro assault. While the first two types are unconscious, this type is very conscious. So these are intentional, explicit derogations characterized primarily by a violent verbal, nonverbal, or environmental attack that is meant to hurt the intended victim through name calling, avoidant behavior, or purposeful discriminatory actions. So I'll tell you a story about my fiance and I. We were traveling to Wichita um, for his daughter's basketball tournament. This was in 2013. And we pulled up at the hotel, it was late at night. We had driven and arrived around 11.30 p.m. And he checked in by himself. So we stood outside and unloaded the car, tried to get everything ready. Then by the time we got to the room, we realized that there were no towels. So my fiance goes back to the front desk to get the towels and he has to wait because the front desk employee is having a disagreement with one of the patrons of the hotel. Now it's important for me to mention their race. So the patron uh, was an African-American male and the woman behind the desk was a Hispanic. So after um, the African-American customer leaves, the patron says to my fiance, black people, they always want something for free. And she said this because at first glance, my fiance looks Hispanic. Um, and so she thought that in that instance, she was speaking in similar company. Um, and so here we see an explicit derogation that employee knew exactly what she was saying. She just didn't realize who she was saying it to. So the next morning, then we go and speak to the manager um, and we receive no apology, no sort of compensation. So we checked out of the hotel, complained, eventually did get our room comped, um, which I feel like fulfills that stereotype that she has that black people always get something for free. Um, but it was definitely an instance of micro assault. We eventually complained to the Better Business Bureau. So as you can see, there's sort of this typology or model of different types of microaggressions. So the micro insult, the micro assault, and the micro invalidation. Under micro insult, there are different types. One is the ascription of intelligence. So this happens when we assign a degree of intelligence to a person based on their race or other different social identity characteristics. Um, being a second class citizen, right? Being treated as a lesser, lesser person or group. 
Pathologizing communication or culture. This happens when people do not speak standard vernacular English. So for example, um, you've heard the phrase maybe Ebonics or black vernacular English, or if there's someone who has an accent because English is their second, third, or fourth language. There's a tendency in US culture to pathologize that or maybe make assumptions about a person's intelligence based on their communication style. Communication style and intelligence don't actually have to do much with each other. You could be extremely intelligent and not speak proper English. Um, speaking English in a particular way or speaking English language in a particular way has to do with your education level. Um, and then there's an assumption of criminal status, so being presumed to be criminal, deviant, or dangerous. For example, many times if I go into a mall or a store, I'm followed around by security or someone's keeping a close eye on me. Micro-invalidation, however, has to do with feeling alien in one's own land. So for example, that's the question, where are you from from? Making a person feel different, making a person feel as if they don't belong. Also this idea of colorblindness, which was popular, um, along with the metaphor of the melting pot. Um, so this is something that's actually been deemed pretty offensive because people who have these different identities sometimes take a lot of pride in them. So to say that you're colorblind and you don't see them can many times be offensive. The myth of meritocracy, saying that difference or diversity plays a little role in a person's success, is very insulting as well. And the denial of individual racism, saying that racism um, is a minimal sort of influence on a person's professional success, for example, um, could be an example of a micro-invalidation. So these all come out of Sue's typology in those two books that I shared with you earlier. The fourth type comes out of a study by Young, Anderson, and Stewart. And this is called a hierarchical microaggression, and it's specific to organizations. These are everyday slights found in organizations that communicate systemic devaluing of a person because of their institutional role that's held by that person. So for example, when you see the intern being mistreated or in academia when grad students take the brunt of the work and they're devalued, their time isn't taken as well, this is an example of a hierarchical microaggression. Um, we rationalize this in US society as sort of paying your dues, right? You have to work your way up and so that way you have to do the grunt work. Um, but this isn't right. We shouldn't devalue a person because of their role. They should be given the opportunity to prove themselves and to work up the ladder on merit. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that they should be dismissed in any way. Characteristics of microaggression that are important to note are that they are constant and continual without an end date. So a person who experiences microaggressions, it starts early in the years of their life. I can remember microaggressions literally in elementary school, and they continue throughout that person's lifespan. They are cumulative, they have a cumulative effect, right? They must also be deciphered because they contain double messages. So the example that I gave you where the woman gave me the backhanded compliments, in one respect, she's trying to say something positive, but what she's not saying is this double message that is difficult to interpret. They are constant reminders of a person's second-class citizen in society, and they symbolize past historic injustices, right? They relate to the enslavement of African Americans, the incarceration of Japanese Americans, and the taking away of land from indigenous people. So they are related to those histories. Microaggressions are like drops in a bucket, right? They seem simple. It's just a comment, just a slight. You should be able to get over it. But over time, there's gonna be one drop that tips that bucket over, right? So when you experience these for years, after year, after year, at some point, something's gotta give, right? And so that's the day where I walk away from the teaching moment and I have the opportunity to go off, right? I just get so angry or so annoyed and it's just been too much. And I'm telling you, those days happen, right? And then the bucket starts over again. Um, but if you take that concept to it, to really understand the cumulative effect, these small instances really have some negative long-term consequences. Microaggressions have been found to lead to physical and mental health issues, a hostile and invalidating work climate, lower productivity, problem-solving abilities, and inequities in education, unemployment, and healthcare. So what seems like a small thing actually accumulates and snowballs into some pretty large macro level systemic issues. These are far from benign slights. Microaggressions have major detrimental consequences for people of color, women, and members of the LGBTQIA community. If you think about workplace opportunities such as promotions, 
many times those things happen during rapport building, right? They're the people who are invited to the golf course. They're the people who are invited out to happy hour. If you're constantly made, made to feel different at work, frequently you're not invited into those informal spaces where rapport building is happening, um, where promotions are being discussed, where job opportunities that are not yet formalized have been presented. And so those types of things have large scale consequences in people's lives. And they lead to micro inequities, a pattern of being overlooked, underrespected, and devalued in an organization. These are often the results of bias in organizational settings. There are a lot of psychological dilemmas that manifest from microaggressions. One can be the clash of realities, right? So how I experience the world and how many of my majority friends and colleagues experience the world is different. Our reality and how we perceive things, how we live through things, how we interpret things are different. And so there's this constant questioning about, did I interpret that the right way? Was that really meant as a microaggression or a slight? Did this person just simply say the wrong words at the wrong time? Um, there's also an invisibility of unintentional bias. We all like to think that we are good people um, and that we walk through the world in a good way. When we realize at times that we've been harboring prejudice, um, this can create a psychological dilemma, right? We don't wanna think of ourselves as someone who's been acting on bi bias or prejudice. So grappling with that creates this psychological dilemma. Also, there's perceived minimal harm, right? So one comment can't simply derail someone's entire career, which is true. It's the cumulative effect of those things. But that perceived minimal harm makes us downplay the negative effects of those types of communication. Finally, there's this catch-22 of responding, right? There's a lot of psychic mental energy spent on how to reply or how to respond to a microaggression when it happens. And so you're constantly trying to first interpret the message. Was there a double meaning? Am I overthinking it? Am I being sensitive? Or no, is this a moment where I should really sort of take a stand and clarify some things? Um, so protecting yourself from these things can sometimes also have backlash, right? If you step up for yourself, if you call someone out on their bias or prejudice, then you can be seen as that employee, as that person on the team. You can be seen as the person that can't take a joke. And so those have other negative consequences to your work life, to your ability to collaborate, to people's ability to feel like they can work with you or work around you. It's important to also pay attention to the difference between inter intent versus impact. Many times questions are happening just because of curiosity. We're trying to get to know our coworker better, so we started asking a series of questions. There was no ill will or ill intent, but that doesn't mean that it didn't have a negative impact. If I step on someone's foot, it doesn't mean it didn't hurt, right? I have to take the onus for the type of pain that I might cause, even if I didn't intentionally or maliciously set out to cause that pain. How can we be an advocate against microaggressions? So we can be aware of our values, our biases and assumptions, do some deep reflection about what are the triggers for you? What are the things that you just have a hard time understanding, getting your head around and accepting? Being aware of those can help you think more about how to extend dignity and human respect to those folks. Um, learn about microaggression theory and research, which you're doing right now, bravo. Uh, explain that intent doesn't equal impact, right? Just because you didn't mean any harm doesn't mean that you didn't cause harm. Show support to targets of microaggression and then call out microaggressions when you witness them. Um, so if you witness one and you're a bystander, then that's important that you sort of help to advocate for those folks. On the next slide, I'm going to um, play a clip that shows someone who sort of steps up in the instance of a microaggression in an organizational setting. My sister-in-law, uh, who's half black, half white, but looks white, blue eyes, whiter than most white folks, very white. Uh, she and I, you know, we kind of grew up together. We raised our children together. Uh, so they're first cousins. And we, you know, it's a wonderful, very, very multicultural family. So we're going in a safe way one day. And um, Kathleen, my, my sister-in-law, is in front of me. And she's, uh, you know, writing a check for her grocery. Now, my daughter, who at the time was 10 years old, was standing with me, and I was directly behind her, you know, getting ready to get my groceries. So Kathleen comes up, and the checker, who is a strawberry blonde, um, freckled, very delightful, warm, um, 
you know, the checker, this young woman, is talking to Kathleen. Hey, how are you doing? This is a nice day today. They're just chatting up. And she says, yeah. So Kathy writes her, her check. And she steps off to the side with her groceries because she's waiting for me. Of course, again, Kathleen looks white, right? So I come up. No conversation. She looks up at me. Absolutely no, just a little chatter. And uh, I write my check. My daughter, however, is 10, notices immediately the difference in how she responds to me. So I write my check, and she goes, I'm going to need two pieces of ID. At which point, my daughter looks at me, and she gets very, very embarrassed, and tears are, are, are kind of coming from her eye, like, Mommy, you're not going to let her do this. Why is she doing this to us, right? So I'm trying to figure out what I should do, because behind Okay, so then I become the angry black woman, right? And they're gonna be, and I just, I'm, I'm just trying to second guess all the drama. So then I, I just give her the two pieces of ID. I said, you know, some things you gotta choose your battles, right? And then it gets worse. She pulls out the bad check book, all right? So the, this is the book that shows the people who've written bad checks. So she starts searching for my license in the bad checks, at which point it's just out of control now. Just as I'm standing there um, trying to decide what to do, and it's really deeply humiliating, now my, my daughter's in full-blown emotionally upset, who's 10, my sister-in-law walks back over. And she steps in and she says, excuse me, why are you doing this? And the checker goes, well, what, what, do you, what do you mean? She goes, why are you taking her through all of these changes? Why are you doing that? She goes, well, um, this is our policy. She goes, no, it's not your policy because you didn't do that with me. Oh, well. I know you, you've been, she goes, no, no, she's been here for years. I've only lived here for three months. And so at this point, the two white elderly ladies go, oh, I can't believe what this checker has done with this woman. And it's totally unacceptable. At which point, the manager walks over. So the manager walks over and says, is there a problem here? And then my sister-in-law again responds. She goes, yes, there is a problem here. Here is what happened. So you see, she used her white privilege. And even though Kathleen is half black and half white, she recognizes what that means. And she made the statement. She pointed out the injustice. And she, as a result of that one act, influenced everyone in that space. But what would have happened? I can't know for certain had the black woman said, this is unfair. Why are you doing this to me? Would it have had the same impact? But Kathleen knew that she walked through the world differently than I did. And she used her white privilege to educate and make right a situation that was wrong. That's what you can do every single day. So this is an example of the way that we can support people who are targets. In that particular instance, she talked about addressing the action, right? We have to address those actions when they come up, not the character of someone. Not to say you are a racist, but perhaps this action that you've done has fallen into one of these isms. So what can we do when we're targets of a microaggression, right? When someone says that backhanded compliment to you, find a support network and have ready to use strategies. So some people like to use humor. They like to have witty comebacks. I prefer a question asking technique. So when someone says to me, you're so articulate, then I start to ask the question, that's interesting. Are you surprised by that? why are you surprised by that? And that gets the sort of wheels churning in someone's mind to really think about the biases that they are operating under and constantly developing an awareness about the ways in which we can use our privilege to help targets as well. So while I many times experience microaggressions because of my gender or race, I experience a lot of privilege due to my um, social class status as well as my education. And I use those times to help out targets, right? When I see injustices happening. What do we do when we're aggressors, right? When we accidentally put our foot in our mouth, uh, proverbially speaking, um, when we say the wrong thing, when we realize that we have inadvertently offended someone or maybe intentionally offended someone. Uh, we can be observant and notice people's nonverbal communication reactions to what we say, right? When they pause, when they take a minute to sort of decipher your message, Listen intently to what happened and really be open to that difficult feedback. If someone has the courage to tell you that you have micro against them or offended them in some way, um, we should be open to that by managing our feelings of defensiveness, by taking responsibility for what we've said or done, and by really reflecting on what we've heard. And this isn't easy, right? It's not easy to heard that you've offended someone 
but it's really a gift. Take it as a gift, right? Because it's not easy for people to speak up and to share um, share those things with us. And then finally, follow up, especially if it's a relationship that you need to maintain and nurture in the workplace, right? So having those types of instances or conflict in an organization can derail any type of progress or collaboration or productivity. But if we follow up later to say, I really thought about our conversation yesterday and I appreciate the fact that you shared with me um, how I offended you and I'm really going to look into that and learn a little bit more about this topic, right? So stop and listen. Finally, there are some practical strategies that I'll just share with you and these come out of the book, Difference Matters by Brenda Allen. Um, and these are mindfulness, meet, it's supposed to be media literacy, excuse me, networking, people first language, and cultural competence. So the first is mindfulness. And this just means that in our organizational surroundings, we should actively process information, be open to new ideas, and be present, right? Be sensitive to the context, have a heightened state of a wakefulness or awareness of where you are. Um, and avoid thinking under the influence, which is TUI, thinking under the influence of stereotypes or bias or prejudice. Um, and if you become more mindful of those things and aware of them in your own life, then you can sort of check them when they do arise. The second is to have a sense of media literacy about yourself. And this is the ability to critique and analyze the media that you consume and its impact in your life. So it promotes an active relationship subject to bias and social constructions. And so while I'm not saying you have to ditch your guilty pleasure of trash TV, I am saying be mindful about how much of that you consume and how you balance that with media that's actually uplifting and promoting positive notions and ideals in the world. Um, many times I will fall in love with a series that is hot and fun to watch, um, but at the time I realize that it's really perpetuating so many negative stereotypes. I have a difficult time sort of taking that media in. The next is networking, right? So there is a large number of jobs that exist in this hidden job market, right? They're not posted, they're simply shared through interpersonal contacts. And you know this phrase, it's not what you know, it's who you know, which is very true when it comes to job seeking. So we have to actively develop personal networks that are diverse and network with people that don't look like us, that don't come from similar backgrounds, right? Whenever I have a student that comes from sort of an underrepresented background or a background that's just different from mine, I make an intentional effort to help that student succeed. So if I can leverage any of the privilege that I have in my own network, if I can make an important connection for them, that could open up doors, opportunities, and chances for them to achieve some upward mobility in their own lives. Then we have people first language, and this is specific to issues of ability. Um, but the philosophy is that people with disabilities are not their diagnoses or disabilities, they are people first. So whenever we're talking about someone who has a diagnosis, we should use um, language that puts them first. So for example, instead of saying, she is a schizophrenic or he is learning disabled, that is is like essentializing, right? It accounts for their being in a totalitarian way. Um, instead, we should say they have a diagnosis of schizophrenia, right, or they have a learning disability. Um, that way, it sort of puts the person first. It mentions this as just one attribute of them, not something that essentializes their entire identity. Um, and often ask yourself, is mention of a person's disability or a race or gender even relevant, right? Many times we mention these things unnecessarily because of those biases that exist. The last one is called cultural competence. Um, and this is just our ability to interact effectively with people from different cultures than your own. And there are four different components. So the first is awareness. So becoming more aware about how culture is operating in our own lives, as well as what our biases and prejudices are, being able to identify those and call them out to yourself. Um, and then being aware of how you respond to the cultures of other people. Attitude is to increase your level of respect for different heritages and different cultures and customs, being open-minded about those differences, not saying that you have to accept them wholeheartedly, right, but that you can be tolerant in a really positive way of those things that you may disagree with. Knowledge has to do with understanding power structures in society and the way that they impact non-dominant minority group members. Um, and increasing your knowledge about institutional barriers, not simply brushing them away as someone who's made sort of bad choices in their life. Um, and then develop and use skills for cross-cultural communication. And then finally, um, 
think about how you can promote this, right? You cannot boost your cultural competence if you're not putting yourself in situations where you're surrounded by culturally different others. So if you're constantly stuck in your bubble, your day-to-day -day grind, and you never really branch out to experience another culture, then you will likely inhibit your own cultural competence. I think that we have a question. Me too. How should we react? How should one react when they witness those that are underrepresented in society, espouse and verbalize stereotypes of their own culture and race? There's no easy answer to that. It's really difficult. Um, many times I do try to call attention to some of those things um, and again, have that teaching moment or education. Sometimes I'll just buy a book and give it as a gift, right? Or say, let's go watch this movie or this documentary as a way to sort of educate and enlighten. Um, but that happens when people are what's called internalizing the stereotypes and you're um, experiencing internalized oppression because you bought into those stereotypes and those negative attributes and ideologies about your own particular identity category. It's very harmful, right? You can begin to opt out of certain opportunities because you don't think that you're qualified. They've noticed this in the STEM professions, for example, in the sciences, technologies, engineering, and mathematics, that women frequently will opt out of those career paths because they've always been told that they're not good at math or science. Um, and so we start to see people participating in that types of internalized oppression. Thanks for your question. So just as a review, we talked about changing demographics and how that impacts our workplace. We talked about difference as the elephant in the room and how that can become an obstacle to valuing difference. Um, as well as defined a lot of key concepts and buzzwords, including intersectionality. I gave you a working definition for microaggressions and then practical strategies for inclusiveness in our own workforce. Um, I would like to share with you a couple of resources in case you're interested in learning more. One of the books I mentioned is this book, Difference Matters by Brenda J. Allen. I teach out of this book in my own classroom, um, and it is specific to organizations and work life, so that can be very helpful. Then there are three books by Daryl Wing Su, who is the top scholar on microaggressions. He's a psychologist, um, a social psychologist. These three books are Microaggression in Everyday Life, Race, Gender, and Sexual Orientation, Race Talk and the Conspiracy of Silence, Understanding and Facilitating Difficult Dialogues on Race, Microaggressions and Marginality, Manifestation Dynamics and Impact. These are also some multimedia videos that are really interesting. Most of them you can find on YouTube. In particular, I'll highlight the second one, Look Different, which is developed by MTV. There are a series of short vignettes that sort of show the psychological dilemmas that people face when they experience microaggressions in their daily lives. Um, we watched the last video on the screen about leveraging privilege, which was the scenario at the grocery store that we listened to. I'll close with this quote. People fail to get along because they fear each other. They fear each other because they do not know each other, and they do not know each other because they have not communicated with each other. I love this. I don't think that communication is the cure-all for all of society's ills, but I do think it's an important start for fostering goodwill, um, human dignity, respect, and understanding across our differences. So here's my final polling question for you. It's my rock chalk call to action. So after our conversation for today, what might you consider doing to make your workplace more inclusive and welcoming? Uh, increase your awareness and education, be more mindful of your own actions, network with people who aren't like you, or celebrate difference. So we'll take a moment while people respond to that final question. I've got about one third of the votes in. more seconds. Okay. We'll end the polling. I'm happy to see that people are going to try a lot of different strategies, right? So we have folks that have voted for all three. Um, these are simple day-to-day -day things that we can do that can really make a positive difference in our world and the world of others. So I'm gonna share with you, if you're interested in learning more, I'm going to repeat the same Link and Learn on the 18th of August from 11 a.m. to 12 noon, Central Time. 
Um, and then in September, my colleague, Dr. Angie Pastoric, is going to conduct a Link and Learn titled Beyond the Performance Review, Giving and Receiving Meaningful, Effective Feedback. In October, she will do a session called Managing Change Through Communication Strategy, Stakeholders, Methods, and Message. We would like to highlight our KU Graduate Certificate in Workplace Communication, which is the host for today's Link and Learn. We have two core courses that are required. One is applied organizational communication, and the second is writing and speaking for decision makers. And then two elective courses. I actually taught a course on this topic last spring called Identity and Stigma in Organizations. This fall, I'm teaching a class at the Edwards campus called Organizational Culture. Um, Dr. Pastoric is going to teach a class about organizational socialization this spring. And then our colleague, Dr. Debbie Ford, who has a joint appointment in the KU Med Center, will teach a session called Communication and Health Organization. We'd like to highlight what we call the KU comms difference. All of our faculty have both professional full-time corporate experience or nonprofit or entrepreneurial experience and a PhD in organizational communication. We love when practicality and theory meet, right? So when those things inform one another, um, we just get very excited about it. Our graduate level courses are filled with upwardly mobile mid-career professionals from top employers across the Kansas City metro area. If you are interested in learning more, um, you can join our website, KU or edwardscampus.ku.edu slash link dash and dash learns. Um, and we also have a Facebook page that we encourage you to like us on and you can find us under KU Edwards Professional Workplace Communication and Communication Studies. So that's all I have for you today. I'm so excited that you were able to join on. I'm going to stay online for another five minutes and give people an opportunity to ask questions if they'd like to chat. Thank you.